Oh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, it, this is my pleasure today to welcome uh, Yashika. And Yashika Dutt is a leading anti caste journalist and the author of Coming Out is Dalit. She spent a decade covering arts, culture, and fashion in New Delhi and a lifetime hiding her Dalitness to pass as upper caste. Until she came out as Dalit in a Facebook note, and this is following Rohit Vimala's suicide, institutional murder. Um, and she wrote a book uh, that's part nonfiction, part memoir, and it's a poignant account of how caste system operates and affects Dalits in contemporary India. Um, her work seeks to expose caste as the invisible arm that turns the gears in nearly every system in India and highlights why this issue needs urgent attention. Her voice has been instrumental in understanding the realities of caste as they exist globally and operate within the increasingly prominent Indian diaspora. Coming Out as Dalit is her first book, and uh, this book has received immense critical acclaim from the press and readers. And her work has been published in New York Times, Foreign Policy, Atlantic, and Coming Out as Dalit is currently being taught at several universities across the United States. That graduated from Columbia Journalism School and lives in New York, and she's planning to come out um, with the book in a worldwide release. And here is the book for all of you. It's a brilliant analysis, and I really uh, ask you to take a look at the book if you haven't. And this is being taught by many scholars who work on cast. Over to you, Yashika, and looking forward to your talk. Can you hear me now? Great. So I'll just repeat all of that again. I was actually thanking Darshana for that wonderful introduction and also to the Center of South Asia and the Institute of International and Religious Studies for inviting me to speak today to Anju Reed Singhani and Sarah Beckham for recognizing the rapidly evolving landscape of South Asian representation in media and inviting me to think through the questions of how caste shows up or is skillfully concealed in pop culture and how we should all be paying close attention to the stories emerging from the South Asian community in the United States. A big thanks also to Andrea Fowler and Tyler A. Lehrer for their endless support over countless emails and in helping me coordinate the presentation. And of course, to Professor Darshanamini again for generously agreeing to moderate the Q&A session after the lecture. I have to admit, it is a bit surreal for me to be present here and giving a lecture on cast for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And not just because I'm doing it over a Zoom link instead of a tightly spaced dark lecture hall on the campus, where many of you would have sat right next to each other and hear me talk to you from barely a few feet away with no masks in sight. Sends a shiver down the spine thinking just about it, doesn't it? It is surreal for me to be here because over just a little six years ago, when I was sitting in my ratty rooftop apartment in, in New Delhi, applying for various journalism schools in the United States, including the one at UW-Madison, I was still hiding my caste. I was hiding that I was born in a formerly untouchable lower caste family that for generations were forced into the caste-ordained work of manual scavenging. Uh, we can change the slide. And I still had relatives who lived in segregated colonies, who went into people's homes to clean their bathrooms and were treated as untouchables as a result of it. I was living with the shame that was foisted upon me because according to the caste system, having been born as a Dalit woman in a manual scavenging caste, I was the lowest of the low, and I was to be treated as such. And while working in one of India's most well-known English language Sunday magazines, I was desperately trying for no one else to discover that about me. I had left Ajmer, the city where I was born, a small town in the arid state of Rajasthan, which attracts thousands of international and American tourists every year. And along with its tourist attractions, is also known for its dismal statistics of child marriages, the death of unborn girl children, and caste discrimination. And I had moved to New Delhi at the age of 17 for a college education, a massive deal for me as somebody whose family until three generations ago 
was not allowed to touch books and had grown up with stories of how my grandfather's father had learned how to write by scrawling a stick in the mud because his touch could pollute the slate and chalk his classmates were using. I had tried to escape to the pulsating urban core of what was then a burgeoning India on its way to becoming a global superpower, hoping that at least there, I would also be able to escape my caste. But what I realized over the next 10 years that I spent in the Indian capital of New Delhi was that caste was the gear that turned every arm in the country. Next slide, please. Including that of the arranged marriage complex featured prominently in Netflix's hit show, Indian Matchmaking. For a while now, the concept of arranged marriages as it stems from the Indian subcontinent has been a subject of fascination in the United States. Next slide. Especially since the tech boom in the mid 90s and early 2000s, when American companies started hiring close to 100,000 Indian engineers and STEM researchers every year, which led to a rapid rise in the population of this demographic. Next slide. In 1996, the book Arranged Marriages, Chitra Banerjee Devakurni's American Book Prize winning work introduced a non-South Asian audience to the concept of Indian arranged marriages. And by 2004, the New York Times had published an article on how the tradition of Indian arranged marriages was thriving in the United States. But unsurprisingly, caste, even then, as it continues to be today, was, was barely more than a footnote. Since then, arranged marriages, along with Bollywood musicals, have become almost synonymous with Indian culture in the United States. No montage of, um, next slide, slide please. No montage of the big American wedding is complete without the token bride red backdrop and gushing bride in traditional Hindu garb. Even in the dark period of the 90s and 2000s, when mainstream media lacked any kind of South Asian representation beyond the casting of the South Asians as background doctors and or terrorists, the Indian wedding always succeeded in getting a seat at the garishly decorated dinner table. Whether as a part of the extended sequence in the Wind Swan, Owen Wilson and Rachel McAdams starter, starter wedding crashers in 2005, as one of the many, many weddings as uh, in the Catherine Hegel as, as part of the as a bridesmaid in 20, 27 dresses in 2008, or as the pivotal scene of the Indian American character Cece's wedding in the fan favorite sitcom New Girl in 2013. The big fat Indian wedding has continued to have a place in the American pop culture. Not to mention the breathless coverage of Nick Jonas and Priyanka Chopra's multiple weddings, one of them which was the traditional Indian style ceremony. So when Netflix with its sights set on the lucrative Indian market, as well as the increasingly influential Indian American community in the US and the rest of North America, decided to create a reality show featuring Indians, it was hardly surprising that it was centered on the lucrative subject of arranged marriages. Next slide. And even though Netflix has not shared any official data regarding its viewership, going by the at least dozen articles published in places like The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, Time Magazine, and the New York Times, which put out not just one, but two articles on the show, countless memes, fan-generated content, and the inter intense interest in the lives of the individuals featured on the show, it is clear that Netflix's gamble of featuring arranged marriages in their reality show featuring Indians has paid off. In a bumper year for the streaming service, when Netflix earned, earned close to 25 billion in total revenue, Indian matchmaking was among 2020's most talked about shows on the streaming service. 
to an audience that has a passing familiarity with the Indian, with Indian culture beyond the famous Tikka Masala, the show was a gateway to finally getting a closer look at a society that has so far been viewed as either cheerfully exotic or diligently ambitious. For most non-South Asians, it also became a chance to know the brown neighbors you've lived alongside for years, but whose customs still seem slightly distant and otherworldly. Next slide, please. While for many Indian Americans, riding on a recent wave of mainstream recognition with two other Netflix shows like the Hassan Minaj hosted Patriot Act and Never Have I Ever, directed and produced by Mindy Kaling, it was an opportunity to flex their cultural muscle and reassert their presence as the demographic to watch out for. And that is why it is all the more crucial to call out the invisible, yet all too present hand of caste in the shaping of arranged marriages and even the larger Indian culture as it exists in the United States. In effect, Indian matchmaking was a reality series styled and produced in the same vein as Netflix, Netflix's extensive range of dating shows like Love is Blind, Dating Around, and Too Hot to Handle. But unlike the other series where participants met each other to decide whether or not they were compatible, Indian matchmaking's premise differed in one significant way. Its narrator and central character, Mumbai-based matchmaker, Seema Taparia, who traveled between India and the United States to alert upper middle class and mostly upper caste Hindu families of eligible marriage-worthy candidates across international state lines. Next slide, please. Over the course of shows, eight episodes, she meets close to 10 straight and cis men and women seeking marriage and asks them questions about their lifestyle, expectations from their partner and their values, hopes, dreams, and ambitions while delivering pithy one-liners like, in India, we don't say arranged marriage. There is marriage and then love marriage. Much to the collective horror of non-South Asians hoping to someday marry their South Asian partners. But unlike the other matchmakers a non-South Asian audience might be familiar with, she doesn't stop there. Seema Taparia, a 50-something upper middle class and presumably upper caste woman who also met her husband through an arranged marriage, often first consults their parents to outline and understand the expectation of their children's marriages. Next slide, please. Because as anyone who knows anything about Indian arranged marriages can attest, it is as if the approval of the parents is as if not more important for your marriage and your spouse. And almost always, their approval is rooted in the sameness of your caste. As popular and as easily accepted the arranged marriages within the Indian community are in the US, there is rarely much thought given to why Indians comply so easily to their parents choosing their spouses for them. Next slide. Or conversely, why are Indian parents so insistent on choosing a bride or a groom for their children? Is it simply because that under a jo joint family setup, Indians are infantilized to such an extent that they can't be deemed responsible to make one of the most significant decisions of their lives? Or because many Indian societies are girded by the control of its young people, in particular its women, who are deemed as the gatekeepers and caretakers of an entire society's honor that's in extricably linked to what they decide to do with their bodies, while often having no say in the basic decisions, like when they can return in the evening? Or is it that Indian societies that are laid, erected, and sustained on a hateful foundation of caste 
need to dictate their children's choices and orchestrate their marriages in the same caste so they can sustain the system of graded inequality through ancient empires, British colonialization, right into the 21st century. Next slide. Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, one of the foremost advocates of Dalit rights across the world and the architect of the Indian constitution calls endogamy, the practice of marrying within the same caste as the essence of caste. In his 1916 paper titled Castes in India, which he wrote as a student at Columbia University and which later became one of the principal documents on understanding of the Indian caste system, he states that if we succeed in showing how endogamy is maintained, we shall have practically proved the genesis and also the mechanism of caste. The continued prevalence of arranged marriages and with it the extensively flourishing caste system in India and the United States, even more than a hundred years later since his paper proved that Dr. Ambedkar was right. Because if that wasn't the case, then the stakeholders of the Indian caste system, the so-called upper caste folks who have thrived on generations of power, privileges, and advantages due to their dominant status in the society, while they have continued to systemically oppress and marginalize those who lie below them, they would not go to these immense lengths they do in order to broker and arrange their children's marriages. Next slide. Even beyond the seemingly benign convention of matchmaking, Indian societies had generated entire industries that only exist to perpetuate the practice of Indian parents finding a suitor for their children from within their own caste. From that one auntie or uncle who even without calling it a business functions as the de facto matchmaker in the community pushing biodatas, which are essentially resume style eligibility criteria for candidates to eager parents, to the Vedic astrologers who specialize in marriage arrangements by essentially matching birth charts of the potential same caste couple and rejecting compatibility if the caste doesn't align to wedding halls and catering businesses that are dedicated to providing space and services to couples who are from the same caste. The big fat wedding business in India is underscored by the all too easily accepted reality of caste. But while these details might be easy to miss, even for some who have spent their lives in the country, the most obvious and telltale signs of marriage being arranged on the lines of caste can be found in India's newspapers inside the matrimonial columns. Across languages, states, and regions, newspapers in India openly advertise the requirements for a fair, slim, educated Brahmin bride, or announce a well-built, high-income earning Baniya boy settled in the United States, who is also looking for a demure, reasonably educated, but not too career-minded girl in India, willing to relocate to the US. Just in case you thought the matrimonial columns were an India-only issue. Next slide, please. In fact, Shadi.com, India's first matrimonial website, whose name translates to marriage in Hindi, was launched in 1997. And according to the website's Wikipedia page, it was done to bring the convenience of sorting eligible marriage-worthy candidates on the basis of their caste to Indians living in the United States and the rest of the world, who couldn't as easily access print newspapers published in their home country. In 2021, the business of matrimonial websites that attempt to masquerade as the diet versions of Tinder, Bumble, and OkCupid, while in reality catering to the arranged marriage market, is a well-established market segment. With dozens of sites, including popular ones like Jeevan Sathi, 
Bharat matrimony and simply marry, listing profiles of eligible candidates on the basis of region, religion, and of course, caste. And true to their founding sentiment, catering to the Indian American consumers remains a priority for most matrimonial websites with almost every single one of them offering special services to finding matches for non-resident Indians in the United States, of course, on the basis of their caste. Despite these machinations, the grooming of children from a young age to accept arranged marriage as a viable and sometimes the only option, and the excess of parental control and intrusions in their marital decisions. More and more younger Indians and second and third generation Indian Americans are questioning the clearly outdated system of arranged marriages and rebelling against their parents to find their own partners and enter what Seema Taparia in Indian matchmaking calls love marriages. But simply, because there is pushback against the mechanism of arranged marriage, which was put in place to sustain the graded inequalities of caste and foisted upon a people based on the basis of a wholly artificial and arbitrary differentiation. It doesn't mean that the caste system itself hasn't mutated along with this evolution in order to continue justifying its existence. Like white supremacy that has since evolved, adjust itself and still into the contours of a rapidly changing population demographic in the US, the caste system in Indian societies and its response to arranged marriages has transformed to keep up with the changing expectations. Not only has the biggest underlying factor of caste completely been erased from the arranged marriage conversation, or at best reduced to a forgettable footnote like we've seen with Indian matchmaking, where caste is barely mentioned aside from a benign appearance as people choosing their own partners on the basis of communities. There is an increasingly mounting and dangerous defense of arranged marriages from various corners of the Indian American community and back home. Next slide, please. With the predictable discomfort of the non-South Asian population with the concept of arranged marriages, the response by several Indian upper caste academics and even mental health professionals has been to double down to try to prove why arranged marriages are actually beneficial and preserve culture, particularly within the Indian immigrant populations. Couched as cultural relativism, Franz Boas's evidently useful idea of how each culture is useful within its own context, there is a growing narrative that since each community and caste has its own traditions, it's crucial to maintain them. Never mind that those traditions are inherently rooted in caste superiority and the oppression of Dalits and that system needs to be fully annihilated. An article published in Rewire, a nonprofit journalism website launched by PBS, quotes a professor of economics who has an upper caste Bengali Brahmin last name and who is working at the Rochester Institute of Technology saying that many immigrants see the modern arranged marriage as an important part of preserving cultural traditions. While another brazenly titled article published in Psychology Today in 2015, which you can probably see on your screens right now, the article wonders why are so many Indian arranged marriages successful? And it answers that question by basically saying that since in a free choice marriage, that's what the author calls marriages that are not arranged, free choice, it is difficult to find a good set of options to choose from. And there are constant complaints of how hard it is to find a good man or a woman. So it's advantageous, his words, to let those who we trust the most 
aka our parents to make those choices for us so our parents instead of gorging a potential partner uh, for their children on the basis of unnecessarily and useless criteria like attractiveness and compatibility can make that choice for us on the basis of caste the author of this article who has a phd and is a professor of marketing at rice university and surprisingly belongs to an upper caste that is famously known for dominating the diamond business in india another mind boggling though equally common defense of the indian arranged marriages that is also cited in the same article is that low divorce rates of couples exist uh, who of the, within the couples who enter arranged marriages so that means if you are entering an arranged marriage you are less likely to get a divorce while conveniently ignoring how indian couples and women in particular face extreme hardships in leaving a marriage that is statistically proven and also they choose to stay in those marriages instead of leaving them even though they might be unhappy or abusive simply because it's so difficult to leave case in point if you read my book you will realize that my own mother who belonged to a dalit family despite being in an extremely unhappy and abusive marriage was unable to leave because divorce was such a difficult option and of course that was a few decades ago but the situation today has not changed that much either not to mention that divorce still carries a stigma both in india and the indian american communities in the united states on indian matchmaking itself we see seema tuparia who finds it insurmountable to land a good match for rupam she's a 36 year old single mother who's divorced her, and she left her cheating partner and now lives with her father in the united states and seema tuparia repeatedly says that she cannot find a match for somebody who is a single mother and divorced while there is also another emerging narrative that is encouraging upper caste men and women to fall in love with partners uh, to fall in love with partners who belong to their own caste so the idea is that's okay if you want to fall in love and enter a love marriage at least protect your caste purity so you don't go around shaming your parents by marrying somebody who is from a lower caste than you or aka a dalit person next slide please unfortunately the pushback from the casteist structures of indian societies that defend arranged marriages is not limited to gentle coercion or soft peddling in academia in reality it takes more dangerous forms like parental bullying intimidation blackmail excessively controlling behavior casual domestic violence and in extreme cases deaths that are congenially renamed as honor killing in one of the more traumatizing sequences in indian matchmaking we see akshay who you can see here a 25 year old graduate from boston confronted by his mother in the kitchen of their lavishly decorated house in mumbai after months of meeting different girls to choose from as his partner he has not yet made up his mind and has failed to select a girl who he will marry his mother who is visibly up upset that at 25 and in less than a year after his return from the us he is still not married shows him a high reading on the blood pressure machine and tells him that his inability to make up his mind about the most significant decisions of his life in just a few months is taking a toll on her health and even forestalling his older brother and his wife from starting a family according to his according to his mother her elder son cannot have a baby unless her younger son is married so she gives him three options of girls to choose from and informs him that if he can't decide who to pick 
she and her father will make that choice for him. So this clearly shows the myth of choice that exists in arranged marriages. While you will hear this narrative very often that these days, the marriages that are arranged still leave a lot of room for the couples to choose. That doesn't change the fact that the couples who are meeting people or through arranged marriages or through matchmakers have intense pressure to find someone and find someone quickly. There is no room for them to make up their mind to extensively date somebody for a year or to just figure out if they are a good match. If they meet somebody and they like them, they must decide and they must decide rather quickly. In my review for the show for The Atlantic, which I'm presuming many of you already read before coming to the talk, I wrote that for anyone including myself, who doesn't meet the neat requisites of arranged marriages and has had to fend off well-intentioned yet emotionally abusive family members, that sequence that I just mentioned has enough material to generate weeks of trauma. On the show, soon after the sequence, we see Akshay go on a family date with a girl and her family, followed by a quick engagement between the couple. The engagement, as we now know, did not lead to a marriage for unknown reasons, and the family called off the wedding. But the haunting visuals of the 25-year-old looking stressed out and staring straight into the ground as his family members talk around him stay with you for quite a while. Unfortunate as that is, this kind of parental pressure is not limited to Akshay's mother who we earlier learn is called Preeti. Even on the show, we see another contestant or eligible bachelor, Pradyuman, who is also from Mumbai, facing a similar kind of pressure to get married from his sister. She tells him that at 30, he is aging out of the market and that since all his friends are married, he should also settle down. So all their lives, and I quote, so all their lives will be calm. If wealthy upper caste men like Pradyuman and Akshay are undergoing this kind of parental pressure, it is not the, a stretch to imagine the toll this pressure takes on women, both from the upper and lower castes, who are under far more control and scrutiny from their parents, and the society in general, both in India and the United States. Outside the show, on popular groups like, uh, on popular Facebook groups like Subtle Curry Traits, which is a digital space to share Desi memes and has over 900,000 members from the global Indian diaspora, humorous posts about parents coercing children into marriage are not only common, but they are a running theme, as you can see in the tweet over here. This was shared on subtle curry traits and it got, it got over hundreds and hundreds of comments where people either identified or laughed or talked about how this exact same situation happened to them where they literally had no choice or say in who they decided, who they were deciding to marry. In the real world, Conversations about parents pressuring their children to get married, not just by a certain age, but also to someone who fits their eligibility criteria of caste, have been a routine part of the cultural discourse for decades now. All too often, couples are forced to break up or separate because they don't belong to the same caste. And a failure to do that leads to increased surveillance revoking access to mobile phones and internet, physical beatings of adult children. And like I mentioned earlier, and you can see the headline here, honor killings. In the Atlantic article, I wrote, marriage, especially between dominant and untouchable castes, can pose a threat to that hierarchy. That explains why people in dominant castes often carry out 
brutal violence against their own family members who dare to marry outside their caste, particularly if a partner is Dalit. Just two weeks ago, which was in late July 2020, three, brother, three brothers from a dominant caste in India, India's Uttar Pradesh state allegedly killed their sister for marrying a lower caste man and shot the husband in the stomach. Last year in 2019, in Maharashtra, a father reportedly doused his daughter and her Dalit husband in kerosene and lit them on fire to condemn their intercaste marriage. So far, it's clear that upper caste structures are interested in preserving arranged marriages because they perpetuate the caste purity and continue the graded inequality that assigns people to a different scale on the basis of their birth as part of the caste system. It is also for the same reason that many upper caste Indians and Indian Americans are often opposed to inter-caste, inter-religious, and inter-racial marriages. Unless, of course, their children are marrying a white person, in which case, Many believe that they are marrying up, buying into the hateful eugenics theory that has been discredited for decades, while they also equate the assumed superiority of their own upper caste to the falsely perceived superiority of whiteness. Marrying into a different caste dilutes the despicable and falsely perceived notion of caste purity. The people who are born in dominant castes have a purer, more superior blood than those who, according to them, are born lower, systemically forced into caste-ordained professions, and or are Dalits, is the entire notion of caste superiority. Next slide, please. It is the same idea that Nazi party used in the beginning of the 20th century to systemically exterminate the Jewish population in Europe and other parts of the world. In her recent book, Cast, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Isabel Wilkerson masterfully outlines the similarities between the racist systemic discrimination in the US, the actions of the Nazis in Europe and the ongoing caste system, which as we've learned, is preserved and perpetuated in part by arranged marriages, both in Indian societies in India and the United States. It is for this reason that it is crucial to understand Indian arranged marriages for what they are. Arguably, as many articles published both in India and the United States have pointed out, caste is not the only criteria when fixing an arranged marriage. Next slide, please. There are considerations of class, family background, and regional affiliations that also come into play. Along with, of course, an unending list of benchmarks that are often placed on the girl, who along with being of a certain age, also needs to be light-skinned or fair as we call it in South Asia, skinny, attractive according to an ever-changing standard of beauty, hopefully not too ambitious, and most importantly, be willing to adjust or compromise or be flexible. This idea of flexibility or adjustment is repeated over and over in Indian matchmaking for those who've seen the show. As we see on the show, Matchmaker Seema Taparya states that Aparna, who is a contestant on the show and is 34 years old, and also a highly successful lawyer, she might find it difficult to find a match because she is too demanding. And people are often scared of women who are lawyers, as you can see in the screen grab. According to an article in Indian Express, next slide, please. Economic and political necessity, along with caste, were also big factors in uh, leading to the creation of arranged marriages in India. However, 
almost all marriages that are arranged by a couple's family are about consolidation of power anywhere across the across the world whether it's in the royal family in britain or china or india in the case of indian arranged marriages this power relates to the consolidation and maintenance of the superiority of caste so while it might be that caste is not the only factor in deciding arranged marriages it is definitely the biggest factor when it comes to deciding arranged marriages the same article that you see here quotes a 2009 study which suggests that despite the economic importance of this decision status like attributes such as caste continue to play a seemingly crucial role in determining marriage outcomes in india the superiority of upper castes of which brahmins are considered at the top along with the inherent and unique patriarchy of indian societies give rise to this condition that we see in india over and over again it's called brahminical patriarchy it's a uniquely noxious hybrid of caste superiority and misogyny that places upper caste men at the top of the caste ladder and dalit women like myself at the absolute bottom and it is this brahminical patriarchy that governs the arranged marriage setup in indian societies across the world next slide please indian matchmaking along with shows like mindy kaling's never have i ever where in the show a hindu woman is shunned from the larger indian community because she married a muslim man and later in the episode she basically agrees to what she, why what she did was wrong and is you know just dismissed we see that kaling as a producer and as a storyteller basically and unquestioningly upholds these caste supremacist and patriarchal and even hindu supremacist values without any interrogation or unpacking or even showing how that action of that woman being insulted and humiliated because she married a muslim man is essentially wrong while shows like these are a huge leap for south asian representation in the pop cultural landscape that has discriminately place indian americans as the other for almost forever these shows also reflect the biases of our societies and allow for caste to remain invisible when in indian matchmaking as you see here the last episode devotes a sizable harry met sally style montage to discussing how indian couples in arranged marriages who either met each other on the day of their wedding or just weeks before somehow turned out to be gleefully happy and in love when the show does that what it is doing is it simply amplifying the dangerous and hurtful defenses that have been perpetuated in the favor of arranged marriages for basically forever caste as it exists within the indian communities has gone unchecked and unrecognized for decades next slide next slide please over 90% of the indian american community is upper caste and i've talked about this before but it's worthy to mention again that this is why it explains that why you haven't heard about caste within indian society still now only recently with incidents like the cisco case where a dalit engineer filed a lawsuit against his brahmin superiors for practicing caste discrimination at the workplace um next slide please and the increasing and visibility and influence of the south asian community caste has been allowed to enter the national conversation in the united states next slide please ignorance or a lack of widespread understanding of caste makes it easier 
for the discrimination against Dalits to continue. And that makes it all the more important to understand and pay attention to the narratives of caste, especially as they continue to emerge in pop culture and all around us. And which is why it's important for us to build on true solidarities. Next slide, please. It's important to build on true solidarities with those who need us the most and call out hateful narratives wherever they exist around us. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. <laughs>